After moving pictures, there was a paradigm shift in Discworld. Pratchett was now comfortable enough in his own voice and skill that he decided to expand on the ideas first laid out in Guards Guards. He never lost his humor, jokes and gags remained a constant part of the series and an integral part of its makeup, but he realized that serious isn't necessarily the opposite of funny. And through this understanding, his art exited its genesis and entered a new phase. Raverman is where I mark the beginning of this golden era. Partially this is due to it being the first book in a Discworld that had its fat trimmed and kinks aren't out, but the other reason... Well, first we need to answer, what is Reaper Man? Death has been sacked! You might think, given how he's death and all, that such a thing would be impossible, but there are authorities higher even than death, and one such authority, the Auditors of Reality, believe that death has gone soft. He's washed up, he's old hat, he's stale cheese, he's wet toast, he's lost his touch, and he knows nothing of the crunch. The what? He knows nothing of the crunch. What's that got to do with anything? What are you doing? That's your first slice of crunch. Get it off. I'll slap you with crunch. I'll bury you in the crunch. As such, the editors have seen to it that death will never work on this disc again. And so, with nothing else to do, death must live life as a mortal, making his way and earning his keep like any ordinary fellow. Unfortunately, while the auditors try to find a more suitable replacement for death, nothing on the disc can die. Not only that, but the auditors' efforts lead to the rise of a whole murder of deaths popping into existence and stumbling around the disc, causing even more complications. The only one who could sort this all out is the original death himself, but where could he be? Surely not on the farm of old Miss Flintworth, who has just recently taken on the mysterious farmhand Bill Dorr. How does the world of Reaper Man work? This is the first Discworld book to feature the Auditors of Reality, who are responsible for making sure that the universe runs efficiently. Unfortunately, they have a tendency to get too invested in their job, leading them to attempt vast overhauls of reality just to make it tidier. And since they regard the least tidy thing in this universe as life itself, these overhauls are bad news for humanity. There is a higher authority than the Auditors, though, also established in this book, that being Azrael, the Death of Universes. As one of the eight Old High Ones, the ultimate powers in the universe, Azrael is in charge of the entire concept of death, and all its forms and variations across all of time and space. The death we all know and love is really just an aspect of Azrael, given, for lack of a better word, life and a personality, something the Auditors find positively untidy. What's notable about this bit of cosmology is that, unlike with many examples of fantasy worldbuilding, including Pratchett's own early attempts, the exact details of how these beings work or how they're organized aren't ever delved into, for the simple reason that such details aren't important. Sure, it would be cool to know the names of the other old High Ones, or learn more things about the Auditors, but none of those things would serve the plot, so Pratchett ignores them. Similar to The Good Place, these powerful semi-divine entities are here purely to provide human drama. This is important because while world-building minutiae let us feel clever for keeping track of them all, most of us simply don't care. Unless there's a character to humanize these minutiae and our learning of them, everyone but the most die-hard fans simply zones out and waits until people start having normal talk again. This is why many authors use a mortal outsider to introduce us to world-building concepts. Someone like Mort, who can have the cosmology of the disc explained to him in terms we can more easily digest. But if you humanize the cosmology itself, give these world-building concepts enough personality that they are characters in their own right, then you can teach the reader about your world purely through the interactions of these characters. Pratchett no longer needs an outsider like Mort to give us insight into death, because death himself is enough of a character to carry a story. This value of personification carries over to the effects the Auditor's actions have on the disc. As they try to iron out a new death to replace the old one, the universe shifts to pick up the slack, and various other deaths pop into existence, like the death of mayflies, the death of trees, and the death of rats. The first two are important because mayflies and trees are used in the book to show how life and death can appear wildly different to non-human beings with wildly different lifespans than ours. Mayflies dying at sunset wistfully reminisce about how back in their day the sun used to be a proper yellow, and trees having an idle conversation over the course of many human years regard the swift, sudden chopping down of a brethren as an instantaneous disappearance. 
The death of rats, though, is important for a different reason. While death has taken many lives over the course of his career, he has never killed anyone before. Unless you count these people in The Color of Magic, but most people don't, so whatever. As Bill Dor, though, one of his duties as a farmhand is to put down poison for the rats, an act which death finds unsettling. The rats not dying, even after eating poison, and the appearance of the death of rats to rectify this, are how death first realizes that the auditor's actions are having consequences that must be dealt with. The death of rats will remain a companion to death for the rest of the series, even after the universe returns to its proper alignment. In the meantime, though, we get to see the effects of Death's absence through the wizard Wendell Poons. While Wendell appeared in moving pictures with the other wizards, his main role in that story was simply to gurgle out Victorian idioms and be a bratty elder. In Reaper Man, though, Wendell becomes a more realized character. As you may remember, one of the laws of the disc is that when a wizard dies, they must be claimed by Death himself. And like most wizards destined to die of old age, Wendell gets a premonition of his death in enough time to return his library books and sort out all his affairs. However, when death fails to show up and take Wendell's soul, it has no choice but to go back to his body, reanimating his corpse and turning Wendell Poons into a zombie. One world-building aspect that I love with this is the way Pratchett explains why it is that zombies are so stiff and shambling. Essentially, because zombies aren't properly alive anymore, all autonomic bodily functions have to be consciously maintained, so the body doesn't properly walk or move like it used to because the brain is busy concentrating on breathing. Don't know why the arms stick out, though. It just seems the thing to do. While Wendell is coming to terms with his recent undeadedness, he runs into the Fresh Start Club, an activist group concerned with the plight of the undead and run by Reg Shu, an SJW zombie who will become a staple of the series from here on out. Their role in the story is mostly comic relief, but they have their moments of seriousness as well, which rather ties into the question, what does Reaper Man have to say? You know, some stories will have a character say the major theme out loud, and some will have a character say the title out loud. But Reaper Man goes the extra mile and does both at the same time. To quote Death, Lord, what can the harvest hope for if not the care of the Reaper Man? On the one hand, this reiterates Terry Pratchett's characterization of death as not being cruel or malevolent, but rather simply someone to dutifully escort us to what comes after life. The idea of a cold and heartless death, who enjoys striking fear in the hearts of men as proposed by the auditors, goes against everything Pratchett's death stands for. People should not fear death, but accept it. From this, though, another deeper meaning can be gleaned. A fun fact about wheat, it has an unusual method of seed dispersal. Human beings have been domesticating wheat for about 10,000 years or so. So long, in fact, that many strains of wheat can no longer release their seeds without a reaper to cultivate them. We turn the seeds into bread, pasta, granola, and aphrodisiacs, all sorts of things. But we also make sure to save some seeds so that a new crop can be harvested next year. It's because of the reaper that the harvest has meaning. Even if winter causes plants to wither and die, with the reaper the harvest can live on, producing progeny and being taken to what comes after life. You can't just cut the wheat all willy-nilly whenever you feel like it. You need to maintain the harvest. Death is an inevitability to us all. But because we know death will come eventually, we strive to make life count. The presence of death makes us appreciate life more and the beauty of life makes us aware of death more. You need both for each to have the meaning that they do. If that alone was the depth of Reaper Man, it would still be a wonderful book, but Pratchett takes this concept of contrasts and applies it even further, in a way I think many authors can learn from. I said before that I consider Reaper Man the beginning of Discworld's golden era. Well, this is why. People always remember Discworld as a funny series, a fantasy world based around jokes and gags and parodies of other fantasy works. But I think a better way to put it is that Discworld is a balanced series. To be sure, it has jokes and gags and parodies aplenty, but when you think of the punchlines of Discworld books, the climaxes and moments we always remember as the best, it's never the funny scenes. Instead, it's Lord Vetinari chastising Sam Vimes in Guards Guards. It's Susan confronting Death and Hogfather. 
It's Granny Weatherwax passing away in the Shepherd's Crown. Why is that? Balance. These scenes are all bittersweet and emotional because by the time we get to them, we've come to know and care for these characters. And we've come to know and care for them through humor. The funny bits don't detract from the serious bits, they make those serious bits hit even harder. By lulling us with humor, Pratchett puts us at ease and suspends our disbelief, so that when the mood shifts and things get grim, we feel it all the more. It's very difficult to pull off that contrast, to perfectly balance funny and serious, but the key is to remember that they aren't so much opposing as complementary. You need both for each to have the meaning that they do. Final Verdict Weird Sisters was the point where I began to appreciate Discworld. Guards Guards was the point where I began to get it. But Reaper Man was the point where I finally fell truly and deeply, madly in love. I regard it as the first masterpiece of Discworld. A 10 out of 10 example that I can only hope to aspire towards with my own writing, and a book I cannot recommend highly enough. This perfect balance of funny and serious is just what I strive to achieve, and what would send Discworld into a golden era, lasting several more books. Now that we've finally arrived, I can't wait to guide you through this new age. For now though, I'm Marco Keen, signing off, and I hope you liked this video. If you did, and you'd like to see me make more, please leave a like or comment down below, share my video via Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or other means, and subscribe to my channel. Also, like I said, that blend of funny and serious is just what I strive for in my own writing, and if you go on over to Amazon and check out my own book, The Song of Morian, Mercy of Monsters, I should hope you would find exactly that. I need to sell 200 copies for the next installment to be published, so please, if you purchase a copy for just one dollar, you'll not only be helping me out, but you'll be getting a great book as well. Thank you all, and I will see you in the next one.